Your Holiness, uh, Geishi Sopa, uh, honored guests, distinguished visitors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Zorba Pastor, and on behalf of Geishi Sopa, Deer Park, the North American Tibetan Association, and the Wisconsin Tibetan Association, it is my tremendous pleasure and great honor to welcome you to a lecture by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. His Holiness has been coming to Madison since 1979. In 1989, after His Holiness was awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, he came to Madison to speak at the Old Fieldhouse. And if I'm correct, this is his seventh visit to Madison. It's clear that His Holiness loves Madison and loves <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, His Holiness says that all major religious traditions carry basically the same message, and that is love, compassion, and forgiveness. He says that the important thing is that they should be part of our daily lives. Be kind whenever possible, and it is always possible. His Holiness says that happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from our own actions. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Now, as a physician, I find that this is the best medicine. These are wise words, are very wise words. And so now I'd like to introduce my good friend, Jim Doyle, who is governor of our great state of Wisconsin, who will say a few words and introduce his audience. I get to do a lot of wonderful things as governor of this beautiful state of Wisconsin, but today is certainly one of the most special. It is a truly an honor to be here today to want to introduce one of the world's most compassionate figures. Since his birth in a small village in North Tibet, His Holiness has truly been a special gift to humankind, including to all of us here in Wisconsin. Throughout his life, he has, His Holiness has faced religious and political conflicts with patience, nonviolence, and a kind heart. Throughout his life, the Dalai Lama has focused on three objectives, to promote human values, religious harmony, and the peaceful resolution of Tibetan issues. In a time when our complex global world has created many divisions, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, has served as an enduring, enduring voice in this world, a voice of unity, compassion, and strength. The Dalai Lama has worked to bridge the boundaries that separate us. His Holiness, as life teachings, whole lessons for all of us, not only Buddhists, but Christians, Jews, Muslims, and people of all religious backgrounds. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has a vision of, of progressive harmony for our interdependent world, one where people look after each other and take moral responsibility for the well-being of all living things. His Holiness lessons can shape not only our personal in, in political relationships, but he is an inspiration for our environmental stewardship as well. So as governor of Wisconsin, I am pleased to host the Dalai Lama this week as we celebrate his many contributions to humanity and we pray for his long life. On behalf of all the citizens of the state of Wisconsin, it is an honor for us to serve as the first Western hosts of the Ten Shug of lo or Long Life Prayers ceremony that will be celebrated later this week. I want to thank the Wisconsin Tibetan and Buddhist community for making His Holiness the Dalai Lama's visit possible here. And we want to give a warm welcome 
to all of you who have gathered from all parts of the United States and all parts of the world here in Wisconsin this week. Wisconsin, when is at its very best, is a state that learns and listens to the lessons of the Dalai Lama. Wisconsin is a place where we welcome diverse ideas and persons, and it is a, it is a state that values great learning. In fact, it was the University of Wisconsin that brought Geshe Sopa, Professor Emeritus, here to Madison. And Professor Sopa has taught Buddhist scholars for over 40 years and has now built a tremendous Deer Park community. So today, as we welcome da the Dalai Lama to Wisconsin for the seventh time, let all of us take a moment to reflect on his message of peace and global unity. His Holy, this often says, in fact, he has said it to me several times, that he is just a simple Buddhist monk, no more and no less. And we all know that is true, but we all know as well that this just simple Buddhist monk has touched each of our lives and the lives of billions of people across the world. So let us all carry forward his message of warmth, sincerity, and leadership to shape the future of this world. We are so deeply honored to have His Holiness here in Wisconsin. And with that, I am pleased to present to you His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sit down. Dear brothers and sisters, indeed, I am very, very happy and a great honor uh, to speak to you. Uh, and nothing special but just our common experience. Uh, and a big number here, as Governor Adhazar stated, the seventh time. Uh, mainly because Kishi Sabala, Professor Sabala, since mid 50 I know him, great scholar, meantime, great practitioner. So I respect him. So because of his invitation, now quite often he used to come to this place. And then also, the people here, I think every occasion, really showing genuine human feeling. A genuine friendship. So that also naturally one reason uh, I come happily whenever I receive one invitation. So, so I'm very, very happy. Meantime, uh, as I usually use stress, when you see large number of people, you see, came to listen to my talk, and I always made clear, that firstly, those people who come here to listen, Dalai Lama's talk, out of curiosity, 
I said, perfectly all right. No problem. Then maybe some people come here to watch what Dharam is saying, <laughs> speaking. <laughs> That's also perfectly all right. Very good. Uh, whenever I talk, and particularly about this Tibet issue, I talk truthful, justice. So, anyone who want to know more about what Dharma is sort of thinking, most welcome. Then, then those people who have some kind of belief, Dharma have something miracle power. That that kind of attitude is dangerous. I have no. Special power, nothing. If I have real miracle power, then I may not face these problems. <laughs> But obviously, uh, I have a lot of problems <laughs> facing, <laughs> not my individual. But because of Dalma's name, is there some moral responsibility there? So as a result, some problems. So simply, just one ordinary person, uh, because of that, is facing some problems and sometimes unnecessary problems, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and then another thing, some people come to see me with believe that Dharma have healing power. That's ridiculous. Of course. Firstly, I do not believe such healing power just to touch physical in something cure or impossible. Impossible. So, uh, if there is uh, people who really have such sort of healing power, then after this meeting, I want to see because you see. My the little finger. <laughs> I think one occasion visit America. Uh, I met some Mongolian. So then I usually uh, shake hands. Sh uh, shake hand. hands. Mm -hmm. So then one Mongolian never let my poor finger. <laughs> no. So as a result, we said now this finger little damage. <laughs> So, if there is someone who have real sort of healing power, this is good opportunity to test. <laughs> <laughs> so, now here, uh, I have nothing special, and my talks also just common sort of experience. Now that is uh, obviously we everybody, whether Easterner or Westerner, or rich or poor, educated, uneducated, believer, non-believer, everybody want happy life. And even, I think, everybody want happy dream, including dream. We want happy, happy life. And I believe the very purpose of our life is, generally speaking, our secular viewpoint. It's simply our purpose of our life. Our goal of our life is happy life. If someone who really lost hope, then that very attitude shorten our life. Then worst case, suicide also take place. So therefore, although no guarantee happiness or happy life, but we survive on the basis of hope for better. 
So hope means something good. So therefore, the basis of our survival is very much based on hope, and that means our really seeking one happy life. So we can say the very purpose of our life is happy life, happiness. Now here, in order to gain happy life, comfortable life, generally we believe the material facilities are the the basis of our happy life. I think we come from a society or community or generation where material facilities are lacking. So their mental sort of tendency is just to seek a better facility, more money, more money. For example, the hunger person, their number one sort of Concern is food, food, food like that. Like that. So now it seems people from a family or society were materially quite affluent. Uh, all facilities there. Then there, now begin to experience the limitation of material value. Naturally, external facilities or material values can provide only comfortable on a physical level. But since we have this sophisticated mind, not like animal. Our sophisticated mind has great potential of vision uh, and different visions sometimes bring hopes, some hopes, unrealistic hope. That sometimes, you see, create more anxiety. And when we face some sort of uncertainty, then too much stress, too much worry. Then I think worst thing, basically we are social animal. Social animal means each individual's sort of future or well-being depend on the group of the people. So that's a social animal. So that's very nature. But individual person, then sometimes is it lost is that concept. Right. Individual is more important than the rest of the community. So, the instead of respect, instead instead of sort of, what's it, the attitude, this is based on my future, instead of that kind of sort of attitude, or uh, simply utilize other, Res exploit, uh, exploit others, exploit other, bully other, that kind of mental attitude. Because your own mental attitude that way. So, that person, then, possible, very possible, is it to get the impression. Others also similar attitude. Exploiting on you. Taking advantage on you. Through that way, automatically develop fear. Suspicion. Distance. That brings deep insight, loneliness, helpless. So all these mental factor. Once some unhappy 
mental state, then you get frustration. That brings anger. That destroy your health and destroy friendship with your friend, my friend. So this kind of attitude is very much against our basic nature as a social animal. Because of the, the basic sort of nature, social animal, you must, you must have very close feeling towards the rest of your community. community. So that emotion or that mental attitude usually we call affection, compassion, sense of concern. If you extend your genuine sense of concern with respect, that brings genuine friendship, genuine trust. And also, obviously, community, healthy community means trust each other. It's the basis. Fear, suspicion is the opposite of trust. Where fear and, and suspicion there, trust impossible. Where trust there, fear and suspicion, then no room. So happy family can build trust, affection. Happy community can develop on the basis of trust, affection. So affection there, trust come. So therefore, people gradually seem to see realizing the importance of certain or uh, mental value. Now in the, in the medical science also, now as Dr. Salpa mentioned, warm-heartedness, compassionate mind uh, brings better health. Constant fear, anger, hatred, very bad for our health. Some scientists once told me the anger, hatred, fear actually eating our immune system. Even you have all material facility you see, resting on comfortable bed, but full of fear, full of anger. And then the immune system then reducing. Just a poor facility, but full of confidence, full of happiness, full of sort of, what's the, uh, what's the good mood. Then, immune system retain, sustain. So our physical health also very much related with our mental attitude. So therefore, and, and also I often, you see, uh, mention the, uh, some scientists already sort of uh, found a result out of their investigation. Uh, monkey, young monkey, some young, young monkey put with, uh, with, with mother. mother, some young separated from mother. Then those, I mean, those young monkey with mother always playful, happy. Quite rare quarrel. Those young monkey 
was separated from mother, uh, always in bad mood, and often quarrel. So we are same. We human beings also, those human uh, children who are lacking affection in their family, their life is really difficult. And their education suffer because of too much sort of rather unhappiness, unsafe. And their physical growth also suffer. Very clear. The worst thing, the rest of their life remain a person who difficult to show affection to other. So these people then often become angry people, too much frustration. The frustration transforms anger, anger transforms violence. So therefore, uh, in order to develop happy society, how to develop happy society? Through law? Through money alone? No. Happy society must create from that. From within. That also, community or society means combination of people. So I think firstly, we must create happy family. And then 10 family, 100 family, 1000 family, like that, then happy community can develop. So therefore, uh, even then few individuals really troublemaker, then can isolate. Cannot much influence the rest of the society, happy, trusted, genuine friendship. So like that, so they, in order to create happy family, compassionate family, firstly, compassion started from individual. So when we talk Happier world, peaceful world. The first initiative must come from one individual. That I believe. Of course, many people know that. So each of us have some potential to create happy world. So that I I usually say promotion of human value in order to have happier humanity. Now, one's own individual sort of the, uh, what's that? Future, future, happy future, depend on the rest of the world. Now, for example, my own case. I'm one individual human being, one of the six billion human beings. So my future must depend on the well-being of the six billion human beings. If the rest of the human beings facing difficulties, more violence, then constant fear. And my own peace of mind, then eventually danger of a happy life. Difficult. So then particularly today's world, new reality, economy reasons, Global economy, heavily interdependent, an environment issue. These are universal issues, Ray. Global issues. Global issue. So, with new reality, the concept of one individual, right, that's selfish. No. Just me generations, Ray. Just thinking in terms of me and my generation. Mm -hmm. It's not realistic. 
according to your reality, I think they're very, their word, we and they, is not relevant. The rest of the world is actually part of you. So according to that reality, we have to take genuine concern, a sense of concern of entire world or entire humanity. Then peace, world peace. Peace ultimately comes from inner peace. Through inner peace, real peace can achieve. Inner, inside, full of hatred, full of suspicion, full of distrust. Impossible to create peace. So peace must come through inner peace. That I call the hatred, suspicion, distrust. These are some kind of violent type of mind. In, in order to create inner peace, we must, we must have inner disarmament. Through inner disarmament, there is a real possibility to achieve external disarmament. These are logical. Cause and effect, cause and effect. Every human positive or negative action related with our emotion, related with our motivation. Motivation often related with emotion, like that. So therefore, the, in order to achieve genuine, lasting world peace, firstly, we should take care about our individual's inner peace. I think that's important. Now there, the most important element is sense of concern, sense of responsibility, sense of community. These are, I think, key factors. So now question compassion or affection. Affection is nothing new to us because Biological factor, the way we born from mother, immediate, immediately after birth, mother's fullest sort of care, maximum affection. With that, we survived. So this body, this life started on the atmosphere of fullest what's it, affection or compassion. That's the way. And according to medical doctors, medical scientists, uh, after birth, next few weeks, simply mother's physical touch is a crucial factor for proper development of the brain of the child. So that's the way, that does not come from religion, but by what is that? Reality. A reality. So after birth, uh, one time in Poland, I uh, visit one children's home. Those children, the organizer told me, unwanted children. All those people, feeding them, dressing them, of course some education, shelter there. But I don't think those children of the mind is really happy. I don't think. Because their mother abandoned. Very unfortunate. So therefore, the affection is, I think, physical product, biological product. product no. uh, they is equipped from the birth. However, uh, if we further sort of invest, further analyze the affection or compassion, mainly come from 
biological factor that is biased, limited, and much depend on the attitude. Attitude. Uh, so that kind of biased compassion cannot extend towards stranger because their action neither harm or helpful, just neutral. So your attitude, affectionate attitude, difficult. Then particularly your enemy, because their attitude is harmful to you, therefore no basis of compassion because that biased compassion based on attitude. But now, through reasoning, as I mentioned earlier, we are social animal, particularly today's reality, everything interdependent, and from the medical viewpoint also, the more compassionate, warm-heartedness is good for health. So all these use these reasons, then develop conviction. Anger is bad. For my own health, very bad. For my friendship with friend, also bad. And the international relations, or in, in every field, anger, hatred is bad. So deliberately try to minimize these negative emotion and deliberately try to positive emotion. Then that compassion or affection can be because of the further promote. Yeah. Now here, nobody can sort of reason you should extend compassion towards your enemy because the enemy is harming on you. It's illogical. So we have to find different way to approach, to thinking, no. to think. That means your enemy Directly harming you on you, but indirectly they're also part of humanity. So my future also somehow related with them. And at least if because of their attitude, if I let anger towards them, it's bad for my health. So better to keep positive attitude towards them. That also Long run, if you keep constantly affection, then today's enemy one day may become your good friend. If you keep continuously your negative attitude, that closed the door, the possibility of become friend. So using these sort of reasons, then disregard their attitude, but they're still part of humanity, they are human beings. So on that basis, you can extend your affection. That affection is unbiased, not based on attitude, but based on being itself. Right, the person. Being person, like that. So that uh, unbiased and infinite, that's a real compassion. So the potential of or seed of that compassion is uh, biological factor, sort of, or sort of biological product. product. Mainly, we experienced the value of affection from our mother. Now, for example, my own case, I have a certain amount of compassion. A seed of this, not come from my teacher, or Buddhist teaching, but come from my mother. My mother, so kind, illiteracy, village farmer, village mother, mother. farmer's mother, mother farmer. illiteracy, but a very, warm, very, very warm hearted person. So my mother is so sort of was compassionate. So that uh, me at, at a very young age, one, one year, two year, Mother, as other child, always is carrying me. So then sometimes 
I bully my mother. I, I hold my mother's ear. I want to go this way. <laughs> go like that. Uh, if my, my mother used to go to the, to the wrong direction, which I do not want, then I cry and go, do something like that. I'm that young boy more aggressor than my mother. <laughs> very bad. So my mother really very, very kind. So I always feel the seed of my today's compassion originally come from my mother. So we everybody have mother. So, so therefore, the compassion is something important uh, that uh, the, actually the potential of that from birth we everyone already have that potential now only quest, only sort of uh, question is, only point is whether we pay more attention and make effort or not otherwise we everybody have the potential uh, this is one thing then another aspect of compassion that is more compassionate attitude. Deep inside, there is some self-confidence. So that means deep inside, you have strength. Anger, hatred, very much little with uncertainty, oneself. <laughs> like that. So compassion means not just the thinking of oneself, but it's taking care of other, concern about other. That means your strength. Self-centered attitude is uh, not thinking other, but one's own thing, not uncertain. That kind of sort of anxiety there. So therefore, compassion brings inner strength. Inner strength brings calm mind. Calm mind is one very fact, important factor the, for the function. function of our brain. Fear, very bad for normal function of our brain. Or anger as well. Therefore, uh, our life Quite complicated life. So we need clear analyze things. Without knowing the reality, without a lack of analyzation, you cannot see the reality. Then all our actions become unrealistic. So every action, of course some mosquito come, that's not much necessary analy analyzation. <laughs> and if you feel hungry, then not much, I'm not necessary to analyzation, just to take food, all right. No need to say, when tomorrow, 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 so uh, when you're feeling hungry, you don't really need to resort to complicated analysis. For example, wondering whether you know, my hunger will be satisfied with the first spoon or the second or the third and so on. <laughs> so what particle about this is the food and what is going on in the inside in stomach? The stomach. Oh, don't need these things, just to take food. Oh. Otherwise, you see, uh, more complicated action, we need clear understanding, clear awareness about the reality, about our goal. And, and the reality. So in order to know the reality, we need investigation uh, through various directions or angles. Just one, one, dimension. one dimension, not sufficient. One of my scientist friend once told me, when you develop anger, then the object uh, which you, you feel angry. Angry. Uh, 
that object appears negative, then actually that negativeness, 90% of that negativeness is actually mental projection. Does not come from uh, text, but from scientist. So very similar. There's a Buddhist text also is mentioned like that. So therefore, the, uh, if your mind agitated, you cannot see the reality. Because agitation comes from one, one, one aspect. There are different aspects. Now, for example, we lost our own country. Last of it, nearly 50 years. If I look only that, that side, that's sad increase. But the same event, look from another angle. Because I, we lost our own country, the new opportunity, meeting with the different people, and particularly me, meeting with scientists, great helpful, meeting with people from different faith, very, very helpful to understand the value of other tradition. If still I'm in Lhasa, in Bodala, sometimes people call golden cage, right? golden cage. Yeah. If I still remain in Bodala, anyway, something like golden cage, cage, right? cage. Golden cage yeah. then my mind, not like today's mind, I think. Of course, still, even today, I'm still learning day by day some new thing, new thing uh, through personal contact like that. Uh, so therefore, and many Tibetan, at least uh, one and a half hundred thousand Tibetan, new opportunity, learning new things, making more friends, and also, you see, they uh, helpful to increase awareness about Tibet, about Tibetan culture. So this negative event brought a lot of positive. So look from different angle. There's not much need, too much sort of uh, sadness. Uh, sadness. Oh, there are positive things also there. So your enemy. Uh, looks, one particular action, uh, you feel frustration, anger, but look from different angle. Not, not that bad. So like that. And something happened. Uh, some, some sort of uh, sad event. If you, if you make a comparison, another sort of worse event, then this event may be more acceptable. More like that. So one event, look from different angle and different dimension. One dimension, three dimension, four dimension, six dimension. Then you get the clearer picture about the reality. So for carry such investigation, normal mind, calm mind is very important. Agitated mind cannot see that. Cannot carry that kind of function. 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 Like that. So, uh, from that viewpoint also, the compassionate mind is something important, something valuable. I think that is about power of compassion. What do you think? Some sense? <laughs> that? Oh. Then if you, oh, so this I usually call secular values or secular ethics. Nothing to do with religion. And the way of approach also is nothing to do with religion. But simply use our common sense, common experience, and scientific findings. That's way. Right. Of course, those believers the theistic religious believer, I use concept of God and to promote these things. The non-theistic religious believer, 
the law of causality, use that concept and promote compassion. Since all major religious tradition carry the same message, message of love, compassion, forgiveness, like that, in spite of different philosophy, like that. So that's uh, my number, number two commitment, which is the promotion of religious harmony. Number one, promotion of human value. As I mentioned earlier, through secular way of approach. So if you have some interest, then uh, further investigate, further think, right. and reflect, on, uh, contemplate. And then uh, try to implement. Then you get some experience, some experience. If you feel something good, something useful, then carry further practice. If you feel not much sort of value, not much benefit, then forget it. No problem. So, thank you. That's my talk. Now questions. Good, 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 good. Now question. Um, when our negative mind is so strong that we are unable to apply the antidotes, uh -oh. what do we do? I think when a negative emotion such as anger or fear, I think fear, there are two kinds of fear. Some fear is reasonable and helpful. And some fear is unnecessary. Uh, so I think basically, I think the hatred keep very negative feeling. Otherwise, anger also can be positive and negative, as well as egoistic sort of attitude also is a positive and negative. In different emotion, generally negative, but more precise, that could be positive due to other factor like that. But then, as I mentioned earlier, the negative fear and constant sort of the anger or too much attachment, then during that moment, is it uh, implementation of antidote is difficult. So there must be some kind of neutral, neutral state. Neutral state. Neutral state. I think one easiest method is just to forget the object which we feel negative things. Uh, forget that, just to concentrate our breathing. Take out, in, out, in, out. Just to, med just to meditate on breathing. 20 times, 30, 40, 100 times. Then afterward, your mind a little bit calmer. Then maybe easier to Apply. think countermeasure. Right. Yeah. Antidote. To right. apply the antidotes. Ah. To apply the antidotes. Oh. Strong anger. And for the moment, don't think both sides. Then meditate on what was that? Breathing. breathing. Then after some time, your mind a little bit calmer. Then think about the positive side. Like that. That's one method. Then basically, like our immune system, the basic our attitude, that's important. Basic attitude, more compassionate, then certain sort of agitations, irritation is to come and go, come and go. Not much you know, the disturb. Effect on. And then easier. So basic attitude is poor, then uh, not easy to tackle these things. So the basic attitude, in order to develop positive basic attitude, Healthy. Oh. Uh, firstly, we need knowledge. Then secondly, uh, constant effort. Then 
Then, thirdly, time factor. Constant effort with fuller knowledge. Weeks, months may not give positive result. Years, then your main mental attitude can transform. So we need patience. And some of our practitioners, or some, some, some people, you see, they want to change quickly. That's unrealistic. Too much expectation. It's unrealistic. Take time. Shaping, new shaping our mind, take time. Not easy. Next question. Um, what is the source of your strength? and endurance in the face of offenses. Shukran, you could say. Oh. Good sleep, good food. <laughs> then, yeah. of course, uh, I call analytical meditation. Not that. And then some problems. As Shantadeva stated, uh, recently I recited that, that sentence, uh, when face tragedy, uh, think. Then if there is way to overcome that tragedy, then no use worry. I mean, no, need, uh, no, need to no need worry. Make effort to overcome that. If there is no way to overcome the tragedy, then no use to worry. Accept. And as a Buddhist, then blame on karma. <laughs> Try that. If you, if you believe God, then to some extent, with respect, blame to on God. <laughs> so, um, what is the most useful method of Virtuous attribute, ah. virtuous, virtuous quality, virtuous quality, quality, to encourage people of all types, individually or in groups, to forgive their previous mistakes and harbor no ill will towards others. Ill will. No. Forgiveness, sir. I think forgiveness may be, I think, related with accept the reality. Something happened. Some bad things happened. Accept that. Then, if other done something, then forgiveness. No use to keep ill feeling. Forgiveness does not mean forget. Well, no. Forget. Or forgiveness does not mean you accept the other's wrongdoing. I think the essence, the essence, the essence of forgiveness, I think uh, not let negative feelings such as anger towards wrongdoing, wrongdoer. Forgiveness does not mean you accept others' wrongdoing. Now, as far as the wrong action, wrongdoing is concerned, concerned. Mm, you need, some cases, you need countermeasure in order to stop that. But that countermeasure should carry out of sense of concern about the wrongdoer. If let wrongdoing continuously, it's harmful for them. So out of sense of concern, out of compassion, stop. Try to stop. Uh, utilize certain countermeasure. So that's, I think, really not letting anger, but out of sense of concern, compassion. That's true, true sense of forgiveness. forgiveness. So sometimes, you see, people get the impression practice of compassion is too much. Um, so that's Sometimes people get the wrong impression that practice of compassion 
involve some kind of foolishness, unable to distinguish between right and wrong. Or indifferent. And so being old. That's not the case. Then next question. Um, it is amazing that the Tibetans have still enough identity to revolt against the Chinese authorities as they did earlier this year. Can you tell us what you know about the status of Tibetans in Tibet in terms of their national identity and the vitality or the survival of Buddhism, the strength of Buddhism among them? I think every sort of human, human community, uh, I think their identity very much related with the culture, cultural heritage. So one, one Chinese professor uh, come from mainland China, I think very uh, unbiased, very honest. So once described, Tibetan culture is stronger than Chinese culture. He observed like that. Perhaps, I think, for example, uh, in China, uh, uh, very recently, now open with the outside world, now already a lot of young Chinese now rashly copying Western lifestyle like that, including Tralsuja. Including uh, dyeing the, the color of their hair. Uh, you can see among the Japanese also. I think among Indian, I think very few. Of course, those Kasada, long in um, apart from maybe some actors who need to do, dye their color of hair for the film they're shooting, but otherwise very, very few in India. I think generally, of course these things, I'm not expert. I think we need more research. Uh, I think the India, under British imperialist sort of control, sort of imp imperialist colony, so the English education, very well, but they retain their own culture. Among Tibetan, um, among Tibetans, I've also seen a few who have dyed their <laughs> hair different uh, colors. But generally, I think Tibet also, you see, we have long tradition of sort of useful culture. I think uh, so that makes some kind of city inner strength. And Buddhism also certainly is a help. Like that. That's how I feel. Then also uh, some occasion I actually you see, express that there should be some research work to what differences the uh, refugee from East Dagestan or Xinjiang and from Tibet and also same Buddhist country like Cambodian refugee, uh, Vietnamese refugee. I want this, someone should carry some investigation. What's the differences of sort of mental level? I noticed some uh, refugee from Xinjiang in early 60s. Uh, one of my close friend, a refugee from Xinjiang, their attitude towards Chinese and the pattern attitude towards Chinese is a little different. There must be uh, due to compassionate oh. attitude. We all uh, usually use a prayer, 
uh, we use the word all mother sentient being. So that means including our Chinese brothers and sisters. Not like that. In the Chinese, I think I, I want to, to share with the big audience the uh, Chinese people. Now recently, due to Chinese government propaganda, uh, the many Chinese is they get the feeling we Tibetan are anti-Chinese. No, absolutely not. We Tibetan very much respect Chinese people as a people. The cultural people and people hardworking, people practical, wherever Chinese community live. Eventually created Chinatown, Chinese language, Chinese letters, uh, scripts, Script. and certainly Chinese good food, delicious food. <laughs> so, you see, they are hardworking and culture people. So we respect Chinese. But then, they, because of government sort of uh, propaganda, Many Chinese, too much emotion, or oh, very much against, against the Tibetan. It's very bad, very sad. So I want to make clear, we, we always respect Chinese people, not Chinese government, <laughs> the totalitarian regimes. Everybody knows human being by nature loves freedom. Totalitarian is obstacle of freedom. So please don't misunderstand our sort of resistance to the, also the regimes because of the the, the dictators sort of what's the stubbornness should not consider as anti-Chinese activities. Please. Next. Um, other religions talk about beginning and end of the world. Mm. What does Buddha say about this? Oh. <coughs> not only Buddha, but also Mahavir the Jain teacher. Jain, what's that? Tampa. No, uh, the teacher of Jainism. Oh, Jainism. I think both, as far as I know, is they both uh, believe in the law of causality. So law of causality means event, certain event due to its own causes. That cause also due to its own causes. So from that way, the cause of another event is actually event of its own cause. So like that, now for example, Big Bang is the anyway beginning of this new universe. universe. But the Big Bang must rather that, have its own causes and conditions. Now obviously, tremendous sort of Energy. energy. Intense ray. Intense. Intense energy. Ah. Dense. Dense sort of energy. That causing Big Bang. So what that energy come? From where it come? What is cause and condition? So go like that, beginningless. So that is the Buddhist explanation. Then another aspect. That is physical level. Another aspect, being or self. What is self? No independent self. Self designated on the combination of body and mind. This body is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, this, the sort of ultimate sort of particles of this body come from parent, 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 and then further goes 
the beginning of the world, the before that, empty space, there are particles, subtle, subtlest of the particle, that's the causes of the later development. So today's my body's ultimate kind of continuation, right? continuation of my body's particle related with those time. So beginningless. So similarly, my mind. Mind is something different phenomena. No shape, no color, no kazoda. Uh, Physical. Form. form. No, no form. form. Mm. So it is something like uh, very subtle energy. That also all, all the time changing. That means there must be causes. There are two kinds. Uh, substantial cause, cause. and uh, cooperative. Cooperative cause. Cause. So cooperative cause, there are physicals. Uh, times also is a factor. But the substantial cause is own similar nature, continuation of similar nature. So from, the, from that way, Buddhists say no beginning of self because no beginning of consciousness. If you accept the beginning of consciousness, then that original consciousness must come from different type of phenomena. That's illogical. So that's the basis of rebirth and previous lives and rebirth, like that. If you feel uncomfortable, then forget it. Don't think. <laughs> no, and within Buddhism, Within Buddhist tradition, there are two types. One say, after Buddha's sort of stage, or higher sort of stage, then this body, when one's body disappear, the being also sees. But most of the Buddhist tradition reject that. There's no reason to seize our consciousness. So therefore, consciousness still remain to highest sort of state, spiritual stage. So from the Buddhist viewpoint, beginningless, endless. Like that. Next question. Um, this is a rather long question actually. Ah. What is my life's purpose and more specifically, how should my life purpose best be served in terms of a future career and my ability to uh, link my livelihood with my spiritual development. For example, right now, I work in corporate America mm. business and make an excellent living, but feel unfulfilled, unfulfilled. Oh. and somewhat trapped. Trapped, although I know this is my own creation, will becoming a healthcare provider or nurse for the dying be a better fit for me in this life? No. Uh, this will mean going back to school and earning less money. Thank you for training, in short, no. what is my next step in realizing and forwarding my life's next purpose? life? Eh? Next step. That the next step. Oh. oh, I appreciate your sincere question. No, very good. I think basically, as I mentioned before, there is external values, material values, and mental values or internal mental values. values. I think we should go more balanced. So I fully agree. This is serving. I mean, the uh, teachers, nurses, there's something directly helping, serving. These are usually I call compassionate action. Wonderful. But we all people involve uh, nursing, or a teacher. Then from where money come? <laughs> we should have businessmen. 
We should have these corporate people. Uh, right. people no? mm. And I think experienced, wise people, very necessary in this field. Otherwise, corporate will collapse. So, human society, we need a variety of people, a variety of professions. But here, every human action, whether become positive or destructive or constructive, is ultimately depend on motivation. Making money, not self-centered motivation or discontent about your own lavish lifestyle. Where? But to think world, think of poor people. There are a lot of needy people there in Africa. People, many people facing starvation. Same people, same human being. They also have the right to survive, not only survive, but happily. So we need money. Then the question is, how to utilize the money? Just a personal sort of lavish lifestyle and using. It's, I think, morally wrong. But we need money and spend. This gap, rich and poor, is really very bad. This gap, rich and poor, a global level as well as national level, here, United States also now, the richer, billionaires increasing, poor people still poor, sometimes poorer. It's shame, it's bad. So, we need money to reduce this sort of gap and provide Missions or where? Uh, the uh, equipment, equipment opportunities, expertise through education. Then the poorer section, instead of frustration, anger, work hard for education, for training, based on self confidence. We are the same human being. And there are helpers, there are richer people taking care of us. Now we must work hard. We must train like that. So I think we need money. So I think your work, uh, I think, carry with sincere motivation and a global sort of view. I think very positive. That also compassionate work, Kasuda, constructive merit, merit, my way. Merit, constructive work. No? Constructive work, and through that way you get accommodation. Very good. Next. Uh, final question. Mm. Um. Um, I am 39 years old and I am a widow. My husband, no, my husband died um, September 1st, 2008 must be 2007. Um, he That's had right. a long battle with drugs and alcohol. Uh, he overdosed at 36 years of age. I need to f find my own inner peace. I struggle with this every day. Can you suggest some ways I can help to center myself to help me find a path through this pain and anguish. I love life and I like feeling happy, but I miss having these emotions. My heart is heavy and my mind hurts. Hurts, got it. No, hurts. Hurt. Now, mm. can you please offer me any advice? Thank you. Very sad. Sad story. 
Çanış da tutmuş. Çan tutmuş şiir sanat. Çan da ne da tamam. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. As I mentioned in my own practice, uh, you also now already experienced tragedy. That already happened. Now I think one thing, instead of you worry, 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 you remain like that. If your late husband really loves you, and certainly your parent, I think really loves you, must be loves you. So some way, your late husband and also your parent, some way to know your mental state today. If your mind's mental state, in spite of this tragedy, uh, try to calm uh, and carry your work normally, I think your late parents and also your late husband, I think, must feel happy. If you remain with this kind of what a very sad state, sad state, then if some way no knowing by your parent and your friend, then they also will feel very sad. So tragedy already happened. Now I think this tragedy should transform your self-confidence and bring more energy. Your life should be something useful for the society, for the community. And through that way, you gain more self-confidence and joyfulness. If you remain sad, 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 then no possibility to gain self-confidence. So work hard. And that tragedy, sadness, should transform new energy. And work hard. And so your own sort of tragedy case, in six billion human beings, such things, plenty. Not just your own case. So that also, you see, I think helpful. Sometimes there's some tragedy happen. Then, your sort of our sort of first reaction is, oh, how bad I had this kind of experience. Then think, oh, among six billion, there are many others also have the sort of, sort of same experience. Some cases are even worse. That also sometimes is helpful to reduce your unbearable feeling. Like that. Then if you believe God, then think of God. This tragedy appears tragedy, but deeper level, there must be some meaning. That also helpful. If you're not a believer, then use our common sense as I mentioned before. Like that. If uh, this question uh, have some sort of knowledge or some interest about uh, non theistic religion, then think law of causality. Every event, every experience, due to its own causes and conditions. So mainly these causes are one's own creation. So certain consequences face today do because of my previous certain action. That also helpful. So thank you. Now firstly I want to express my uh, appreciation the organizer and also my uh, appreciation the governor who personally come and introduced me. So I very much appreciate.
Thank you. Good night. Ah. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. I, on behalf of uh, Venerable Geshe Serpa, Dear Park Buddhist Center, North American Tibetan Associations, would like to sincerely wish to thank his holiness for his words of compassion, love, and kindness. Now it's our effort, our turn to put his words into practice. And that promise, I hope we all individually and collectively will make it to him in a couple of days when we make, when we offer him the long life prayer. So thank you very much, everybody, and especially His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to touch physical in something cure or impossible. Impossible. So, uh, if there is a, a people who really have such sort of healing power, then after this meeting, I want to see. Because you see, my you see, little finger, <laughs> I think one occasion, visit America. Uh, I met some Mongolian. So then I usually uh, shake hand. sh uh, shake hand. hands. Shake mm. hands. So then one Mongolian never let my poor finger. <laughs> no. So as a result, he said, "Now this finger, little damage." <laughs> so if there is someone who have real sort of healing power, this is good opportunity to test. <laughs> so now here uh, I have nothing special and my talks also just common sort of experience now that is uh, obviously we everybody whether Easterner or Westerner, or rich or poor, educated, uneducated, believer, non-believer, everybody want happy life. And even, I think, everybody want happy dream, including dream, we want happy. Happy life. And I believe the very purpose of our life is, generally speaking, our secular viewpoint is simply our purpose of our life, our goal of our life is happy life. If someone who really lost 
hope, then that very attitude shorten our life. Then worst case, suicide also take place. So therefore, although no guarantee happiness or happy life, but we survive on the basis of hope for better. So hope means something good. So therefore, the basis of our survival is very much based on hope, and that means our really seeking or want happy life. So we can say the very purpose of nonviolence and a kind heart. Throughout his life, the Dalai Lama has focused on three objectives to promote human values, religious harmony, and the peaceful resolution of Tibetan issues. In a time when our complex global world has created many divisions, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, has served as an enduring, enduring voice in this world, a voice of unity, compassion, and strength. The Dalai Lama has worked to bridge the boundaries that separate us. His Holiness, as life teachings, whole lessons for all of us, not only Buddhists, but Christians, Jews, Muslims, and people of all religious backgrounds. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, has a vision of, of progressive harmony for our interdependent world, one where people look after each other and take moral responsibility for the well-being of all living things. His Holiness's lessons can shape not only our personal and, and political relationships, but he is an inspiration for our environmental stewardship as well. So as governor of Wisconsin, I am pleased to host the Dalai Lama this week as we celebrate his many contributions to humanity and we pray for his long life. On behalf of all the citizens of the state of Wisconsin, it is an honor for us to serve as the first Western hosts of the Ten Shug of lo or Long Life Prayers ceremony that will be celebrated later this week. I want to thank the Wisconsin Tibetan and Buddhist community for making His Holiness the Dalai Lama's visit possible here. And we want to give a warm welcome to all of you who have gathered from all parts of the United States and all parts of the world here in Wisconsin this week. Wisconsin, when it is at its very best, is a state that learns and listens to the lessons of the Dalai Lama. Wisconsin is a place where we welcome diverse ideas and persons and it is, a, it is a state that values great learning. In fact, it was the University of Wisconsin that brought Geshe Sopa, Professor Emeritus, here to Madison. And Professor Sopa has taught Buddhist scholars for over 40 years and has now built the tremendous Deer Park community. So today, as we welcome da the Dalai Lama to Wisconsin for the seventh time, Your Holiness, uh, Geshe Sopa, uh, honored guests, distinguished visitors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Zorba Pastor, and on behalf of Geshe Sopa, Deer Park, the North American Tibetan Association, and the Wisconsin Tibetan Association, it is my tremendous pleasure and great honor to welcome you to a lecture by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. His Holiness has been coming to Madison since 1979. In 1989, after His Holiness was awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, he came to Madison to speak at the Old Fieldhouse. And if I'm correct, this is his seventh visit to Madison. It's 
clear that His Holiness loves Madison and loves <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, His Holiness says that all major religious traditions carry basically the same message, and that is love, compassion, and forgiveness. He says that the important thing is that they should be part of our daily lives. Be kind whenever possible, and it is always possible. His Holiness says that happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from our own actions. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Now, as a physician, I find that this is the best medicine. These are wise words, are very wise words. And so now I'd like to introduce my good friend, Jim Doyle, who is governor of our great state of Wisconsin, who will say a few words and introduce his audience. I get to do a lot of wonderful things as governor of this beautiful state of Wisconsin, but today is certainly one of the most special. It is a truly an honor to be here today to want to introduce one of the world's most compassionate figures. Since his birth in a small village in North Tibet, His Holiness has truly been a special gift to humankind, including to all of us here in Wisconsin. Throughout his life, he has, His Holiness has faced religious and political conflicts with patience. Let all of us take a moment to reflect on his message of peace and global unity. His Holiness often says, in fact, he has said it to me several times, that he is just a simple Buddhist monk, no more and no less. And we all know that is true, but we all know as well that this just simple Buddhist monk has touched each of our lives and the lives of billions of people across the world. So let us all carry forward his message of warmth, sincerity, and leadership to shape the future of this world. We are so deeply honored to have His Holiness here in Wisconsin. And with that, I am pleased to present to you His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Thank you. <laughs> Sit down. Dear brothers and sisters, indeed, I am very, very happy and a great honor uh, to speak to you. Uh, I'm nothing special but just our common experience. Uh, and a big number here, as Governor Adhazar stated, the seventh time. Uh, mainly because Kishi Savala, Professor Savala, since mid 50 I know him, great scholar, meantime, great practitioner. So I respect him. So because of his invitation, 
Now, quite often you come to this place. And then also, the people here, I think every occasion, really showing genuine human feeling, or genuine friendship. So that also naturally one reason uh, I come happily whenever I receive one invitation. So, so I'm very, very happy. Meantime, uh, as I usually use this stress, when you see a large number of people you see, came to listen to my talk, and I always made clear, that firstly, those people who come here to listen, Dalai Lama's talk, out of curiosity, that's perfectly all right, no problem. Then maybe some people come here to watch what Dalam is saying, <laughs> speaking. <laughs> that also perfectly all right. Very good. Uh, whenever I talk, and particularly about this debate issue, I talk truthful, justice. So, anyone who wants to know more about what Dalai Lama is sort of thinking, most welcome. Then, then those people who have some kind of belief, Dalai Lama have something miracle power, that, that kind of attitude is dangerous. I have no special power, nothing. If I have real miracle power, then I may not face these problems. <laughs> but obviously, uh, I have a lot of problems <laughs> facing, <laughs> not my individual, but because of Dalai Lama's name. Is there some moral responsibilities there? Yeah. So as a result, some problems. So simply just one ordinary person, uh, because of that, is he facing some problems and sometimes unnecessary problems <laughs> like that. <laughs> and then another thing, some people come to see me with believe that Dalai Lama have healing power. That's ridiculous. Of course, firstly, I do not believe such uh, healing power. 